good to be together this evening. Again, grateful for the opportunity to draw closer to the Lord, and as we do so, to draw closer to one another and support one another and see the joy and beauty of uh, just making it that much uh, closer to the ultimate goal, to be with God forever for all eternity. Truly a blessing when we think about in the midst of all that's going on in our lives and in the world that we can sometimes lose sight of that and think that all these problems and all these things are going to go on and on and on, but they're not. And the choice is uh, where we dedicate our lives now will determine uh, where we get to spend eternity and hopefully uh, we can be encouraged by the Lord to focus our minds on Him and enjoy that blessing that all these things that we're going through now are, will be an afterthought in the midst of an eternity with God. And so we want to be encouraged by one particular um, very young man, Josiah, I think is a great encouragement for us all to think about uh, how worthy God is of serving and how worthy he is of giving our absolute best to him. <laughs> Uh, when Jesus was on the earth, there was no shortage of shots people took at him to try to expose him, to try to make him seem as if he did not understand the law or uh, was misguided in his preaching and teaching. He was unorthodox. They didn't like it. He was untraditional. They didn't care for that. Uh, he was actually going to the heart of the matter. And they didn't understand this. And so, so many people were just totally confused by so many of the things that Jesus did or didn't do. How come you don't wash your hands like the elders do? How come you don't uh, have these long prayers the way others do? How, how come you don't fast? How come you don't? On and on it went. And there was once uh, a lawyer who tried to justify his meticulous keeping of the law and traditions and, and took a shot at Jesus and said, I want to ask you, what? what it, what do you suppose? What is the greatest law? What, what's the most important? I, there's so many you dismiss. And Jesus answered, the greatest is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And this answer blew the, the lawyer away. He was astounded. He was actually influenced uh, by this answer of Jesus to consider his own actions. And remember what he said? He said, you have stated correctly. He never thought about this. And he said, you have stated it rightly because to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind is better than all burnt offerings and all sacrifices. And Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're on the right track. I want you to keep that spirit. And that really is the best thing that we do. That's the goal. That whatever it is that we seek to honor God or keep his commandments, that it is wholeheartedly with everything we have and that we realize what a privilege and an honor it is to serve God in that way. And we want to look at one man named Josiah, yeah, who if we were to sum up his influence, sum up uh, his reign as a king, it would be this statement. Because we find this statement describes him in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 in verse 31. Here's the summation of Josiah. It says, Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes. Notice, with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant written in this book. Now that's, that's worthy of our attention. That's worthy of our Examination, but there's one another reason why this is so impressive from Josiah. Number one, we're going to note that how young he was when he decided to do this. At eight years old, he becomes king. Eight years later, in its eighth year, he's 16 years old. At 16, he decides, I want to serve God. And at 20, he decides, I want to serve God and go all out which is pretty impressive in that, but there's another reason why that's impressive. What's impressive about that attitude is he could have done the very, very minimal, least amount of devotion to God, and it would have seemed like an amazing improvement <laughs> because of how awful the situation was around him. He becomes king in a divided kingdom. He's king over Judah. 
At that time, there was the divided kingdom. There was the northern and there was the southern. Well, when Josiah becomes king, there is no northern. <laughs> it's gone. Assyria has taken them away in captivity because of their how far they turned away from God. And guess what? Judah, no better. Prophet after prophet after prophet warning them, pleading with them. His own grandfather, Manasseh, uh, did not heed those, those warnings, and, and they went so far uh, away from uh, dedication to God. In that kind of climate, it would have been so easy for Josiah to say, you know, let, let's, let's take a couple steps towards God. Well, let, let's make some few minor improvements. And even if he would have done that, it would have been major. It would have been major. But it seems to be that Josiah, when he started considering God and considering stepping into that arena of service to God, it was as if his mindset was, if I'm going to serve God, there's only one way to do that, and you've got to go all out. <laughs> there is no halfway. No. No, if we're going to serve God, we need to do it with all the enthusiasm, with all the dedication, with all the determination that we will honor him and we will do it the very best we possibly can. And what's so amazing about that, it influenced the rest of the nation to practice that. Others saw how devoted and how excited he was about worship and how, how serious he was. But let's get rid of anything that would even tempt us to think about going away from our direction closer to God. And it says that all these people were actually able to stand with him. So for the moment, we just want to focus our mind and attention. I just want to focus on three areas specifically that show what does Josiah teach us about what service to God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul, what does that look like? And we'll see three specific things that Josiah did that says what this means. One of the first things we see is that if one decides to serve God with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind, it will be evident in one's personal walk. In other words, when one decides that service to God is reasonable, it's, it's, it's what is expected, it's the right thing to do. Uh, wisdom and the teaching of Jesus, and of course at this time, this is outside of Christ's teaching, which makes it even all the more extraordinary. They, of course, had the law, which told them in Deuteronomy that they were to serve God with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind. But so many individuals really struggled with that. And so it's impressive that Josiah decides, I'm going to make sure that if I'm going to serve God, I want to make it almost impossible for us to go backwards. I want to make it sure that if we're going to serve God, there's only one direction, to keep moving forward. In fact, it reminds me of a, a great story of a, an explorer who once had a crew of individuals on their ships and they, they were traveling for so long they really enjoyed staying in the ships but the captain knew eventually i'm gonna have to get these people off the ship so that they could explore with me and settle in some of these territories we finally got to the coast and was trying to excite everybody to get everybody motivated to come out and, and could tell his crew is this a little cantankerous and realized they felt a little bit more comfortable in, in the ships even though they would have really enjoyed uh, all the conquests they were going to have if they would have got out. So he encourages them finally to get out of the ships, and the first command was, they stood on the seashore and says, I want you to look at the ships. And they all went up in flames and burned them. He burned the ships. And the story goes that he did this to say, there's only one direction, men. We're not going backwards. <laughs> Forget about getting in the ships. Forget about going home. We're not going there. We can only go forward which is precisely the first thing Josiah did was try to make it virtually impossible for them to backslide. No, knowing moving forward is difficult. Moving forward is challenging. And there's going to be that temptation as we make certain uh, adjustments and we start to, make, to maybe feel out of our comfort zone and we want to maybe go back. Josiah realized that and made sure, I want to make sure that's not even a thought in our mind. So guess what? I'm going to eliminate all the high places. Every place where it was possible for people to set up altars, I'm going to destroy even those places so they can't do it anymore. He actually, the mindset was burn the ships because we're going this way. And he did it at the age of 20 years old. So we read in 
2 Chronicles chapter 34, read it in verse 1. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. He's eight years old when he becomes king. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. He was committed. For in the eighth year of his reign, so he starts at eight, eight years later, now he's 16. And at 16, he makes the dedicated decision, I'm going to seek God. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father David. As he starts investigating, he starts getting close, starts realizing the, the, the power of God, the, the reign of God, the importance of God in one's life, and, and, and how submission to him means good things. And that it is a good thing to honor God. It is a good thing to love God. It is a good thing to respect God. And he began to do this in his heart. And so notice it says, and then in the 12th year, in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, the carved images, and the molten images. What's interesting is as he grew, something began to occur to him. And no doubt what began to occur to him is the tendency we have even in the desire to serve God. Something we talked about this morning, even when the spirit is willing, isn't the flesh weak? Aren't there tendencies for us to think about, to maybe go back and he decides, you know what, if we're going to go forward... It's all too easy to go backwards, so I'm going to eliminate the temptation. Again, something that Jesus, who taught us a practical uh, thing to implement in our own lives, if we are going to serve God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, what do we do if the eye causes us to sin, or the hand causes us to sin, or the foot causes us to sin? Again, not easy. Not maybe what we're... Our instinct is to do, but yet wisdom teaches us, wouldn't it be better to eliminate even the temptation? Even though the, the, the heart says, well, I want to serve God, and I have a desire to do better, and I have a desire uh, to move forward. The flesh is weak. Temptations will occur. And so he was so dedicated, he said, I want to make it easier so that we don't go backwards. Let's get rid of all of this. And that's what he did. He just started eliminating all places where there were, were remembrances, where there were habits, where there were, were places where it was easy to go. And he, he said, let's get rid of all of this. Notice he says there, he says, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, the carved images, and the molten images. In verse 4, he says, they tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and the incense altars that were high above them, he chopped down. He also the Asherim, the carved images and the molten images, he broke in pieces and ground to powder and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed them. And it wasn't enough just to get rid of it. Say, well, we'll, we'll just put it away. It's like, I'm, I'm going, I want to have the very image of what we're seeking to destroy. Destroy. Why? Because if I don't destroy that, it will destroy me. If I don't destroy that, it will destroy me. He recognized that. What a wise young man. Here in his about his 20s. And recognizes we need to take action. And recognize we want to move forward. And so there in verse 5 it says, Then he, he burned the bones of the priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem and the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even as far as Naphtali and their surrounding ruins. He also tore down the altars and beat the Asherim and the carved images into powder and chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. So it begs the question, it is a good question for us. Do we see the wisdom of if we're going to serve God, let's serve God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And if so, are we prepared to burn the ships? 
Are we prepared to get rid of the exit places? Are we ready to say it's too tempting, too comforting to go backwards? I want to do this with all my heart. I want to go forward. I want to move, make progress. Josiah is a great example that there is a way a wisdom. And again, Jesus encourages us and even challenges us with this. Let's turn over to the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 9. Jesus says in Mark chapter 9 and verse 42, he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better if, for him if with a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Josiah, with a wonderful uh, level of, of wisdom, he demonstrates that this is necessary, this is good. It may be difficult, it may be challenging, but we recognize the weakness of the flesh. We'll grasp, we'll look, we'll seek something to pull it into its place of comfort where that's wrestling against the spirit which goes in a different direction. So what a blessing that Josiah could see how necessary this was. So we see this in his personal life, his personal dedication. Something else is it eventually morphed into that second commandment. He was so uh, just committed. He, he was so uh, just enamored. With what, what do I need to do? What, what personal adjustments? What, what good things can I do to, to keep me going forward and keep others? Again, it led to others, not just him, but he also had that attitude for a love of others. Then in other words, when we have that dedication, we're so dedicated and we're so uh, wanting to, 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 to just comb over every possible area of our life and see where improvement can be made, see where adjustments can be made, see where temptations can be uh, cut off before it's too late. We start realizing, well, wait a minute, I'm not the only one who has this problem. Or, or, or I'm not the only one who, who needs to, to have this kind of dedicated mindset. We start thinking of maybe others, and that's exactly what Josiah did. What's interesting about that is that there was a word that came praising Josiah for how dedicated his heart was. And the, and the message comes, God has seen your heart. And God has seen the way you wept when you came across the word of God. It had been hidden for so long. He begins restoring the temple. And guess what? In restoring the temple, they find the, they find the law. It been just tucked away, hidden. No one had even bothered to look at it or read it. And he comes across it, and he is so moved because he just absolutely, it breaks his heart. That if only they had had that, if only they had had the, the word amongst them, and maybe they hadn't gone that far. But he's so determined that the beauty of God's word starts working on him and, and the beauty of God's wisdom and, and, and the worthiness of God to be honored and worshipped. And he starts saying, we need to treasure this book. But it's not just him, which is impressive because the word of the Lord comes and says, guess what? You are honored because of your attitude when the rest of these people are going to be destroyed. But not you. In fact, we're going to spare you. You won't have to see it. Eventually, God is going to Bring down his wrath, but we're not going to do it in your lifetime, Josiah, because God saw your heart. Notice that in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, and verse 14. In verse 14, it says, When they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Hilkiah responded and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the scribe, or the book of the law, in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Then Shaphan brought the book to the king. 
and reported further word to the king, saying, Everything that was entrusted to your servants they are doing. They have also emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And Shaphan read it, read from it in the presence of the king. Note verse 19. This had a profound impact on Josiah, just hearing the word. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. It was as if he was, this was wisdom that could have left so much destruction avoided. Almost as if he was maybe contemplating and thinking about the northern kingdom. Oh, if only they had heard and listened, they would not be in the situation. And maybe worried about the present situation of his fellow men. Oh, if we don't listen to this, then the same thing's going to happen to us. So he tears his clothes. And then verse 20, then the, the command, or king commanded Hilkiah, Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, of Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. He recognized we need to get the word out. But notice what word was brought to him. As we keep reading, notice verse 22. It says, So Hilkiah and those whom the king had told went to Huda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokath, the son of Hazra, the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke to her regarding this. She said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the curses written in the book which they have read in the presence of the king of Judah. That's why he tore his robes, because he realized what he was reading were the curses. And adding it up and saying, yes, this has been done. Yes, this has been done. This has been done. And this is what happens. A curse. Realizing that's the place they're at. He says, yes, God will bring a curse. Verse 25, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and it shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. Thus you will say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel regarding the words which you have heard, Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before God, when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and because you humbled yourself before me, tore your clothes and wept before me, I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, so your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place and on its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. Now there's one person in the New Testament that if he were king, we know what he would have said. He would have said, I thank God I'm not like these other people. <laughs> They're going to get a curse, not me. There's one we reread of him. <laughs> Jesus talks about him. He went to the temple to pray. Remember, that was his attitude. I'm so thankful that I, I'm not going to get a curse. I'm not like all these other people. It was impressive. Josiah maybe had any right to think that way, but he didn't. Instead, he spent the bulk of his reign hoping that those curses would not happen and tried to bring the people out of it. <laughs> He wanted everybody else to receive the same blessing he had. And he was concerned for other people. That's, he recognized, yes, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, is to have the same concern he has for me, for everybody else. And so guess what he did? He made sure everybody else got to hear the word along with him. And he made all kinds of arrangements for the, the Bible to be read. He wanted people to hear it. He wanted people to be in the presence of it. One of my favorite verses, he coerced, he brought people, he encouraged, he motivated. He said, I want you to stand right here with me. His mindset was, I'm going, I'm going to the place to rest with my fathers, to be with God, and I want you all to be there with me. It says in 2 Chronicles 34, 32, 
he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand with him. That was his motivation. Notice what he did. Go to verse uh, 29 of chapter 34. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 29. Here's what his attitude was when he heard that there was a curse going to destroy all the people living where he was. He got busy trying to help them. And it says in verse 29, Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people, from the greatest to the least. And he read in their hearing, all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. And guess what? It started rubbing off. It worked. These same people who a curse was pronounced upon them, they start turning because of Josiah's great enthusiastic influence to say God's worthy of worship. So we see, notice verse 30, 31. And verse 31 says, Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant written in this book. Moreover, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand with him. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers, they returned. Josiah removed all the abominations from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel and made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. I love that phrase there. In other words, not only did he remove the high places where he was, he removed the high places in all these other places because he wanted to make it easier for them to turn. In other words, it wasn't just, well, I did it. I, I, I listened to God and I, and I made my changes and I did what I need to do. Now it's your turn. The scriptures tell us, strengthen the hands which are fallen down. Help the fallen. Strengthen the weak. Encourage them. Help bear each other's burdens. Galatians chapter 6, a commandment that very similar to what Josiah was doing. The idea that when we see individuals who are struggling in their sin, to try to do whatever we can possible to lighten their load as we see them struggling with their own desire to turn. That it might be difficult. What can I do to help and to assist? That's what Josiah was doing. He was helping getting rid of all the same temptations and places that he was in his town and he got rid of the places that he so it wasn't just oh come hear me hey let me let me help you let me get rid of some of these things that aren't good for you and then make it easier for you to come and hear some of that is good for you but here in galatians chapter 6 that's what jesus tells us he says in verse 1 brethren even if anyone is caught in any trespass you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted and verse 2 bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Help put the shoulder in the work that they're doing to come back to the Lord and see what we might do to make it a little easier. And that's what Josiah did. He knew, he recognized the difficulty, how much they would have to change. And so he said, here, let me make it easier. Let me help you. So in verse 33, we see the impact. It says, Josiah removed all the abominations from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel and made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. In other words, he helped make it easier. And that worked. And so in other words, it says, throughout his lifetime, they did not turn from following the Lord God of their fathers. He made such an impact. By what? Love with all of his heart. Love with all of our hearts says, we're going to serve God. Let's go all out. Let's destroy anything that might tempt us to go backwards. And let's help anybody else who has fallen away. Let's help bring them back. Let's motivate them. Let's encourage them. Let's inspire them. And here, can I help make it easier? Is there something that's tempting you, something that's making it difficult? Let me help you get that out of the way. And he did that. And the third thing we see that he did that had major influence is he had an amazing, passionate attitude about worship. It was contagious. It was amazing. 
In fact, I love what 2 Chronicles 35 verse 18 says. There hadn't been a Passover before Josiah nor after it. <laughs> the Passover of Passovers. And there were two reasons for this. One, some might think, well, what, what, what might someone do to really spice up the worship that might make people previously who had no interest to want to come? I realize there's all kinds of right thoughts we have. Well, what, what would make, you know, we see that the temptation maybe to maybe we get a, some form of entertainment, maybe, maybe entice them to maybe think about worship. Maybe, uh, maybe something that, uh, that appeals to us in some way. No, it wasn't any of that. All, it was actually very simple. What it was, was Josiah felt so passionate about God, he showed people that details matter. And it's worth going through all the things that God has commanded and positioning everything just right and going through the effort. Effort matters. And he made this, this, this demonstration that if you're going to put effort, put some sacrifice behind it. And he made an elaborate, enormous sacrifice personally from his own possessions that inspired other people to see what he was trying to do. He was trying to say, God is worthy of this kind of activity. And we're going to worship him. Let's do it right. That was inspiring. The idea of we're going to worship God, let's worship him right. And so he went back, guess what, to the law of Moses and made sure, well, how did Moses arrange? What did Moses say we should do? That, do it that way because that pleases God. And people were inspired by this. I know sometimes it doesn't seem odd to me. You mean it's me as simple as what does the, the Bible say and let's do what the Bible says? Yes, that's, that's what he did. And it was encouraging. Notice it says in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 1. It says, Then Josiah celebrated the Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. And they slaughtered the Passover animals on the 14th day of the first month. Why? Because that's what it says to do. That's when it says to do it. He made sure we're going to do it on this specific. And, and this day becomes special. This day becomes a day of honor. And he, and he made sure people looked at it. That, wait. In verse 2, he set the priests in their offices and encouraged them in the service of the house of the Lord. He encouraged them. In other words, aren't you excited? Hey, guess what you guys get to do? Kind of thing to see. Guess, what, guess where we get to go this Sunday? That's kind of what his attitude was. He encouraged them. He made them understand what a privilege, what an honor it was. And therefore, if we're going to serve God, let's do it the way he prescribed. Verse 3, he also said to the Levites who taught all Israel and who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, built. It will be a burden on your shoulders no longer. Now, serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. Prepare yourselves by your father's households in your divisions according to the writing of David, king of Israel, and according to the writing of his son Solomon. Moreover, stand in the holy place according to the sections of the father's households of your brethren, the lay people, and according to the Levites by division of a father's household. Now slaughter the Passover animals, sanctify yourselves, and prepare for your brethren to do according to the word of the Lord by Moses. Two things here. God is worthy of all these details, and everybody participate. Let's everybody get into this. Everybody has something to do. Yeah, he encouraged them. Everybody had a place, and everybody had a... And he encouraged them. No, this means, this is purposeful. God will be honored by the service you provide. And he made them understand that there was important work. And they all felt this sense of, of joy in it. And then he went above and beyond what any other king had previously done from his own personal resources to help facilitate all this. Look what he gave. In verse 7, Josiah contributed to the lay people, to all who were present, flocks of lambs and young goats, all for the Passover offerings, numbering 30,000 plus 3,000 bulls. These were from the king's possessions. What he wanted to demonstrate was, if we're going to go all out, let's go big. Let's sacrifice big. Let's get involved big. Let's do it with everything we've got because he's worthy. That's what this worship is about. It's about him. And he orchestrated this for his purposes. Let's give him that glory he deserves. That was his mindset. 
And it was so encouraging. He even got people designated, and, and previously they didn't do this, but they had a whole orchestra of singers. They had a bunch of people standing and, and, and were dedicating to, to giving this sense of, 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 of holy, uh, pure, uh, uh, righteous uh, singing. The way that we're commanded as we engage in singing to the Lord and singing encourages and teaches one another, inspires one another in our worship, but that's what he did. Notice it says in verse 14, 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 14, says afterwards they prepared for themselves and for the priests because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were offering the burnt offerings and the fat until night. Therefore the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. And notice again, notice the duration. How long did they do this? Until night. They were saying, let's really go all out. Notice what he says in verse uh, at the end of the verse, he says, And the, the gatekeepers at each gate did not have to depart from their service because the Levites and their brethren prepared for them. In other words, because they were busy offering their, their portion, which was in verse 15, singing. The singers, the sons of Asaph, were also at their stations according to the command of David. And so then we get to verse 16. And verse 16 says, So all the service of the Lord was prepared on that day to celebrate the Passover and to offer... Burn offerings on the altar of the Lord. According to the command of King Josiah, verse 17, Thus the sons of Israel who were present celebrated the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days. There had not been celebrated a Passover like it in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet, nor had any of the kings of Israel celebrated such a Passover as Josiah did with the priests. Had never seen anything like it. So really, just encouraging these three points that Josiah personally found it was worthy to do. One, if we're going to serve God with all of our heart, let's make it really, really difficult for us to go backwards because he's worthy of going as far as possible in terms of honoring him the best we can. And two, that kind of dedication is worthy of helping others who struggle with that. And so it's worthy of our attention and our dedication to put the Lord of of God in front of others and make it easier and, and help others to find the joy of Bible study and listening to God's word. And three, when it comes to worship, it's worthy of the ultimate sacrifice. It's worthy of putting every effort into it. And it's worthy of saying, how can we please God in the utmost by honoring him according to his word, according to his ways, that we might give him the highest amount of honor and glory. And so anyone who's with us who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we encourage you that also you would see the joy of coming to the Lord and giving him all of your heart. Why? Well, because God has given you all of his, whether you've deserved it or not. God, as he especially has left it all on the field. He left it all on Golgotha. There was nothing left. He gave every ounce of love in an environment and then a culture and a society that didn't do anything to deserve it. And so when we come to that present reality, Josiah didn't have that. We have that picture. How much more do we have every reason to give God honorable service that's worthy of honoring his sacrificial love for us? And if you're here and have never taken advantage of that, we plead with you, take advantage of it. Obey, turn to him, repent of sin. Uh, as Jesus died on the cross and was buried and raised, so you too might be buried in water to rise in newness of life. He who believes is baptized will be saved. I encourage you to do that before it's too late. And if anyone has... Uh, done so but struggled to uh, not be as dedicated we encourage you here's an opportunity for us to help and assist you and pray with you uh, help bring you out of the struggles you're in and help become more dedicated to God whatever the case is we will stand and sing the song while we do we ask you come to the front let us assist and help you obey God while we stand and sing together